Okay, let me start by thanking the organizers for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure being here and it's a pleasure to talk in this session on Spintronics in Graphene. And uh, I got advice by the, by the previous speaker of taking the spin out. There's too much spin in now, so I cannot take it out. And I'm very happy actually to show you our uh, recent progress we made on spin transport in Graphene. In particular, I will show you that we now can exceed spin lifetimes in Graphene uh, above 10 nanoseconds uh, by non-local spin valve measurements. OK, let me start by mentioning the people which were doing this work. And it's in particular the work by Mark Dregler and Frank Fulmer. These were uh, both PhD students. So Mark is actually defending end of this month. And also Bernd Pichotten played a major role in this uh, effort. And I can already say here that without the HPN from Japan, uh, it will be very hard to do this type of uh, quality measurements. OK, the outline is as following. I will first show you non-local spin transport measurements. And I will also then show you that we, at room temperature, can have spin lifetimes above 12 nanoseconds. We have spin diffusion lengths at room temperature of around 30 micron. So I, I, it's, I think it's important to emphasize this because it means that we can start making devices. Uh, and uh, also having carrier mobilities on the order of 23,000. I mean, this shows us that there's still room to get better. I mean, we have nowadays in the lab, we have room temperature carrier mobilities in graphene exceeding 100,000. So you see there's still a factor five we may go. I will then show you also a way how we make CVD graphene, uh, where we now reach routinely values of around 100,000 uh, and uh, 350,000 at low temperature. Um, I will also show you one slide where we can go up now to 3 million at low temperature CVD. Uh, and the last part is now more or less combining these two. We are now started to use the CVD graphene to make a spin transport experiments. And uh, their current status is that we are now above one nanoseconds. But this is still also work ongoing. OK, now I think I don't have to say much about graphene. But it's a very interesting material for spintronics. It's low, uh, very weak spin orbit interaction if there is no substrate around. Uh, and we also have a very weak hyperfine interaction which actually promises long spin coherence times. And I think about the values one can debate, but a few hundred nanoseconds to one microseconds, or there are some theoreticians which did some calculations some time, were claiming even larger values. So all what I want to say here is that actually all early experiments got way lower numbers. So uh, the first experiment actually uh, started off in the group of Bart van Wees. So Nicolas uh, Tombros uh, was reporting in 2007 uh, values in the range of 100 to 200 picoseconds. So that was kind of a disappointment because the theoreticians were, I mean, motivating experimentalists to do experiments. And they said, oh, you can get large numbers. And then actually these numbers appeared. But I think it's uh, what happened then uh, with progressing you see, by improving spin injection efficiency, one already had half a nanosecond. And then in 2011, on bilayer, uh, there was values around two nanoseconds. I also put up here now, first work on CVD graphene. They're also exceeding uh, one nanosecond. And actually, it was in the last uh, two years, or one and a half years, where now also HPN started to come enter these experiments. And uh, you see that this is an experiment from uh, Groningen, uh, where there is now uh, spin diffusion lengths around 19 micrometer. And this is our work uh, from last year, where we actually get now these very high numbers. And actually, HPN is playing an important role in this experiment. It is in particular the interface uh, which is playing an important role. And I think with these experiments, we start now entering the regime where we are maybe probing intrinsic properties of graphene and not only the contact interfaces. OK, let me start with um, the prototypical setup of experiments which we use. Uh, I start with uh, some older measurements on silicon 
uh, on silicon oxide systems. So typical samples uh, in early days looked the following way that we have this silicon oxide substrate and there is exfoliated graphene and then uh, there are ferromagnetic contacts which are separated by an MGO uh, barrier. So we have, uh, so these are all type of contacts and then we use actually a configuration of four contacts such that we can actually drive uh, a current on one side. So here you see in our cross section, so the black part here is the graphene and we have MGO as a tunnel barrier and then the cobalt. We drive the current here or this way and then we measure the voltage drop non-local at a different part of the graphene. And what actually happens here is by having this ferromagnetic contact, we get a spin accumulation underneath this contact. So you see now depending on the uh, magnetization of this contact, we actually get an enhanced population of spin up or spin down electrons. And this is now the electrochemical potential, for example, of spin up electrons. And actually starting from this contact, they diffuse in both directions. So they diffuse in this direction, but they also diffuse in this direction. And now we actually probe, uh, or we can probe now the difference in these two electrochemical potentials by looking at this voltage drop here when switching the polarization of this contact here. And so what you see here is now what we plot, an important quantity in all these experiments is the non-local resistance, which is nothing else than this voltage here divided by this current. And that's the reason why it's non-local because, well, the current passes somewhere else than the voltage path. And um, now if the injection and the detection electrode, which is this one, are parallel, then we measure a finite uh, value of around above one, uh, eight ohms. And now if we change the magnetic field, this is an in-plane magnetic field, which allows us to switch the magnetization of first this electrode and later this one. This is also the reason why they have different thicknesses. So there are different switching fields. And if we now go here, you see now they are anti-parallel. So actually this guy here switched. And you see that suddenly the local non-local non -local resistance dropped. And uh, we, if we go further, then we go from this anti-parallel configuration again back to the parallel configuration. So we go actually uh, back to this trace, so, and the, this distance here, so this delta R is directly proportional to the difference in the electrochemical potentials of spin up and spin down underneath this electrode. Now we can also now sweep back, and you see this hysteresis effect, which simply comes from the switching behavior of the, of the contacts. But now taking this signal, uh, we can now study spin transport and all what we have need to do next is we have to apply also an out of uh, out of plane magnetic field uh, so you now you see a top view of this configuration so here is the out of plane magnetic field and all of what I showed you so far was there was zero B field uh, but if we now start turning on this B field we get actually while diffusing uh, we get a spin precession so you see I'm injecting in this direction. Uh, so this is the magnetization. And then uh, my spin actually can precess in this B field. And now that's exactly now this curve which you see here. So here we plot again this non-local resistance. What I showed you before, so this is a different device. Before we had here eight ohms, now we have three ohms, but it doesn't really matter. This is now parallel configuration. If I start now, switching on the out-of-plane magnetic field, my spins are processing and this resistance goes down. And if I would have just one electron, I could even see oscillations, but as this is a, I mean, we are really having a diffu diffu uh, diffusive system here, uh, we see kind of uh, this behavior here. Now we can understand these curves very well, so they are known Handle curves, and the width of this uh, curve is related to the spin lifetime, but uh, the way how we can now extract this, we can actually fit this curve by the so-called Bloch-Torre equation, which is given here. Uh, and all what is in this equation, you see there is one term which uh, takes into account the Larmor precession when diffusing uh, or having the spins diffusing from this context. So this one, then we have uh, the uh, diffusion uh, itself, and then we have a term which takes care about the spin relaxation. 
And actually, there are the two important parameters which we can fit now. And I mean, this quantity here, S, is directly proportional to the delta uh, R. And so we can fit. Now with this expression, we can fit this curve. And we get the spin diffusion constant out. We get this spin lifetime out. And I mean, having these two quantities, we can also calculate the spin diffusion lengths. And I will mainly show now spin lifetime and spin diffusion lengths when we characterize. For example, for this particular sample here, which was really in silicon oxide, similar made as the one in Groningen, and you see uh, there's 120 picoseconds, so it's a small number. Uh, I will show you now that we can do better. OK. Now, if one is doing such experiments um, on many samples and is now plotting the spin lifetime, which one can extract uh, as function of the carrier mobility, which we can also measure. Uh, then actually, this was one of the very first plots, which was generated in Aachen. And at this time, this was a collaboration with the group of uh, Barbaros Oselmas in Singapore. And actually, the finding was, OK, there are single layer samples and bilayer samples. And uh, actually, one can get uh, reasonably nice values. But the bad side is that actually, you have to go to very low carrier mobilities. And that's something one does not really want. Uh, so this is surely showing that there's a lot of uh, not yet understood because, I mean, the spin uh, lifetime is proportional to, or it's scaling with 1 over the uh, carrier mobility. So actually, one would like to have values up here, but not in this corner here, because uh, the diffusion lengths you can easily imagine is, is quite small here. Um, and indeed, when plotting the uh, spin lifetime as function of the product of the contact resistance times the area, so this is the so-called RCA product, one can see that there's a relation between the contact resistance and the spin lifetime. And this is a signature that actually what we probe here is mainly limited by the contacts. Because it shows us that the, more, the higher amic our contacts are, the better or the larger the uh, uh, spin lifetime is. And I will show you later that in the newer generation of samples, we clearly deviate from this behavior. But in all these early experiments, the spin lifetime which got extracted is actually not an intrinsic property. So it's mainly limited uh, by, transport, uh, by the contact itself. Uh, OK. So the goal is now, what can we do in order to get uh, longer spin lifetimes and larger mobilities. And I think an important step there is now understanding actually what happens at the contacts. And on these devices, we were looking quite careful uh, on this MGO uh, graphene interface. And actually, what, is, what one can quite clearly see um, by various experiments now uh, is that actually we're limited by pinholes. So the interface forming on the uh, graphene, so graphene is not a good seed layer for growing MGO. And uh, in particular, it, it, it really leads to a, a lot of pinholes in this system. And one has to find ways of increasing the quality of the interface between the tunneling contact, so the ferromagnet, then we need a tunneling barrier, and then we need the graphene. Uh, and actually, this by Placing everything on silicon oxide and putting the contacts on top, I think that is not a very clever idea. And that actually was then leading uh, to the f approach of putting, making everything upside down. So we call this the bottom-up fabrication, where we make now the ferromagnetic contacts first, then the bar tunneling barrier, and then we place the graphene on top. And this way, we can actually do much more heavy processing on making the contacts, and we do have very little processing steps afterwards when we once place the graphene. And uh, the devices look the following. So here you see now silicon oxide and cobalt MGO. So it's one nanometer of MGO layer uh, sitting on, on top. And now we use uh, HPN uh, for picking up graphene. So we do exfoliation of graphene on one sample. And then we use a PDMS. So glass slide with PDMS stamp uh, for uh, 
picking up first the boron nitride flake, and we use then this boron nitride flake to pick up a graphene. And then at the very last step, we simply place this down. So it's actually also quite a faster way of making samples, because all this one can make heavy parallelized. Uh, and then only the last step is kind of the art of making and finalizing the sample. Uh, and here you see such a, a, a fabricated sample. So these are now the ferromagnetic contacts. The green part here is the boron nitride. And if you look very close, you see here some faint line uh, or area, which is the graphene part. And what you also can see now in this sample is that where it is greenish, there the graphene HPN actually is touching the silicon oxide. And there are also some parts here, these orange parts, where actually it's suspended. So it does not touch uh, the silicon oxide. You see this actually better here. Uh, and we can now use confocal Raman imaging. So here you see two, just two Raman spectra from this region and this region here. You see uh, we can, or one can now decompose the information taken from the G-peak and the 2D peak to extract information on doping and strain. I will not have time to go into these details, but it's a very powerful technique because we can really uh, image such structures. So here you see now an image. Uh, for each pixel, we took such a Raman spectra and taking the information from the G-peak and 2D peak, we can extract now information on doping. And what you see is that, for example, here, when the graphene is touching silicon oxide, the doping goes up. If you compare this region here, there's suspended, there's the doping is low. But you also see uh, when we look at graphene placed on contacts, we had quite a high doping. And I think that's also something which is important. I mean, all our contacts are not, they're invasive. They change uh, the Fermi level in our graphene substantially. Um, and we can also now look at strain. So we see that uh, we have quite a significant strain in the regions where the graphene is not suspended. Uh, you see this here and here. Uh, interestingly, on these devices, we at the moment don't see any difference when we do spin transport uh, between suspended and non-suspended areas. This gives us an indication that we still may be limited by the context. <laughs> and not by the channel itself, OK? I show you now data from this channel A, which is this part here, and the B, so the suspended and non-suspended. These are the two regions I will show you next. And this here is now such a Handler curve, now from the uh, suspended region. And you see, again, Handler curve for the, having the parallel aligned configuration of injector and detector and the anti-parallel. And again, we can do this fitting procedure and we can actually get out the spin lifetime. And you see now that on these devices, if you go far away from the charge neutrality point, we can get spin lifetimes exceeding two nanoseconds. And we can also get spin diffusion lengths uh, exceeding 10 micrometers uh, on these devices. And if you, so the carrier mobility which we extracted at room temperature was uh, slightly exceeding 20,000. But you also see now, so A is the suspended, B is non-suspended, and if you look at these graphs, there is no big difference. So I think this is an indication that even in these devices, we're still limited by the interfaces. Um, and um, so uh, we performed these experiments also on bilayer and trilayer, and you see, for example, for trilayer, we are very coming very close to four nanoseconds spin lifetimes, that shows us actually that the bilayer and trilayer are mechanically a bit more stable, and it seems that they uh, form better interfaces. OK, now, <coughs> how does this fit in this picture, which I showed you before? So again, spin lifetime versus carrier mobility. And actually, now, if you use this bottom-up approach with the HPN, then we are ending up here. So we are definitely now going into the right corner. Now the question is actually how far can we move up here? And um, this is something, uh, so the way how we move further up is actually being much more careful now in processing. And it took us quite some time to realize 
that even if we make these bottom-up devices, so I mentioned before, we have this gas slide, and we have PVA PM, um, and PMMA, so we have a polymer stack, which is used as a stem. Then we have the, bo the poronitride layer and the graphene underneath. So there's one way where we have to use chemical solvents to remove the polymer, which is sitting on top of the boronitride. And when this happens, then the solvents can also creep underneath. And it's exactly what you see here. So this is actually a picture taken while the sample is in the solvent. And you see here these interference fringes. That's simply because it's floating. The boronitride is not sealing off our device completely. Solvents are creeping underneath. And making graphene wet is a bad idea. Uh, so in order to keep quality of graphene high, try to keep it dry all the time. I always say to the students, it's like a, a wet newspaper. Once it's wet, it's, uh, you can iron for a long time. You will never get it as flat as it was originally. So I think it's very crucial. I show this also later uh, uh, when we uh, discuss the CVD graphene. I think that's one of the key messages. If you want to have high quality graphene, try everything to keep it dry. Otherwise, you need suspended graphene and do heavy current annealing. I think that's the only thing which properly works. OK, now uh, the point is afterwards, after the processing, this, this exact sample looks like this. So here you have a hard time telling if this guy has seen water or solvents or nothing. Um, and this was actually a typical sample which gave us numbers on the order of one to two nanoseconds. Now, we now really try to avoid this. And so we made samples where we used larger HPN, uh, such that we can seal this area completely off. We now also make samples where we don't take, don't do any uh, release, or we don't put the samples any longer in solvents. So we simply leave everything on top, uh, keep it dry. Uh, but here you see now one such sample which, where we know that no solvents creep underneath. This here is the graphene. We can prove this by Raman. Uh, and then we can, again, do uh, non-local spin transport measurements. You see here all these contacts. And now we get values. You see at around charge neutrality point, we have values of around 4 nanoseconds. And if we go now up in, high up in the electron side, we actually get values clearly exceeding 10 nanoseconds. And you also see that the, the uh, spin diffusion length really goes up to the order of 30 micrometers. And to be honest, we have no clue where the limit is. I mean, we made a few samples uh, where we were coming in this regime, uh, but we still have indications uh, that uh, the uh, silicon oxide, so there's still silicon oxide underneath, uh, may, may do limits. Now, I can again put this into this plot here. So that's what I showed you before, and now we are actually here. So we see that we could still improve a bit here. So 100,000 at room temperature. So all what I show you here is room temperature. So we, we will never go beyond this barrier here. Because I mean, 100,000 at room temperature, I mean, at one point we are limited by phonons. <laughs> it's very hard to fight, fight against them. Uh, but in this direction, we don't know uh, how far we can go. OK, uh, now I go back to this plot where we have the spin lifetime versus the RCA product. You see already, this are the new data I, uh, from the first bottom-up uh, experiments. And I think what's important, if one looks at uh, the theory paper here, where they were putting up a limit for uh, the spin lifetime um, as a function of RCA product, uh, when spin absorption is limiting the process. So that would mean that all values of spin lifetime should be lie, lying below this red line. You see that already with this data, we start going beyond. And actually, with these very recent experiments, uh, we are clearly above this. So this is actually now an indication that we start seeing physics, which is really limited by the graphene and the graphene with the substrate around, and not any longer by the contacts alone. Um, OK, how can we scale this? I have five minutes. Or I'm done completely. Maybe not. OK, I can go quick. OK, <laughs> I can go quick. OK, I think all what you should know is that we can grow graphene on copper. 
this looks like this. And we can, I think the important part is we can pick it up with no wet chemistry. It's a pure mechanical delamination. So we, f we can place boron nitride in a way onto this graphene that the van der Waals force between graphene and boron nitride is stronger than between copper and graphene. Okay. This way we can make samples. Uh, they look like this. We can do, we can characterize them. We can show that they are much better than if you etch away the copper. Uh, and uh, we can do transport, we can make devices, we can do transport. These are typical curves at low temperature, room temperature. You see, many devices we make are routinely above 100,000. We can get the room temperature. Okay, this here has around 70,000. Uh, but the maximum values we get are on the order of 350,000. If we do ballistic transport experiments like uh, Volodya, just showed in the last talk, uh, we can do non-local transport and look at overshoots. We can actually estimate values on the order of 3 million CVD graphene. I think that's record. And we are only limited by the size. We know this. We, we currently work very hard. OK, this is hard to see. This is a, one of our largest sandwiches we built. 100 micron scale, 300 by 200 micron. And we are now shooting for 400 micron. Uh, I think that's doable, so we are talking to our Japanese colleagues. Okay, now coming back to, we use now this and make uh, spin transport on CVD. And so it looks like these are our crystals. We make this pickup here. So th here we rupture it off, okay? And then we place it here. So now the graphene is sitting here on the edge of this boron nitride. If we do this, uh, you can already see, I mean, now it's very hard to protect this edge the values are in the 100 picosecond regime. Not good. So that's, uh, or that's why we started to have another technology where we now pick up, rapture the graphene from the center, place it, and now we do reactive ion etching. And then we have a bar. We use another HPN. We pick this up and place it on our structure. Uh, this is actually also a nice. Uh, and then it looks like this. The nice thing about this, about this technology is we can now make any shape. It, I mean, OK, this is a boring shape, but we can do now much more fancy stuff. And with this device, OK, we do non-local uh, spin transport, uh, room temperature. This is a, a handle curve. I mean, I'm going quick now. But what we can see is that in these devices, we can go on the order of one nanosecond. Uh, we still don't know if. We are limited now by the CVD graphene, <laughs> or if it's the context or the way how we make the devices. I mean, there's still something to investigate. Uh, but I think this is also my summary, and I'm happy to answer questions.